Hi everyone, and welcome to another episode of The Android Show. Florina Montanesco here, Android developer, architecture and compose enthusiast, and your co-host for the show. Today, we're taking you behind the scenes in the world of Android, and we're focused on three big things. First, the latest in Jetpack Compose, Android's modern UI toolkit. Next, we'll explore the world of Android tablets, including all of the new features in 12L, which went to AOSP earlier this week. And finally, Android 13. But first, I want to introduce you to my co-host, fellow Jim Rath, long-term contributor in the Android community, and Google developer expert, Huen Tue Dao. Hi. The Android developer community has always been the core of everything we build at Google, from Kotlin to Compose. And what better way to honor that? that Huen, you know, you don't have to tweet at me anymore. We're in person. You can just talk to me. Huh? Oh, sorry. It's been a while since I talked to anyone outside of tweets and code reviews. Hey, everyone. Super excited to be here with Florina and my fellow devs. Over the past two years especially, the Android community has been more than a place to complain about build speed. It's really been a way to stay connected while we've been stuck at home, and at least for me, a reminder of all the joys of developing. You know, like when you're building a UI screen and then things just work from the first try, or bits. <laughs> Or what about finally understanding coroutine yeah. scopes for the first time? Yeah. Or when you get to demo a new feature to a global audience. Oh, the show, right. So before we jump into tablets and Android 13, we wanted to talk about Compose. Last month, we released Jetpack Compose 1.1, which contains new features like improved focus handling, touch target sizing, image vector caching, and support for Android 12 stretch over scroll. Compose 1.1 also graduates a number of previously experimental APIs to stable. And with that, I heard you got to go behind the scenes with one of my favorite topics in Compose, animations. Yeah. Let's take a look. If you don't already know this about me, it's worth noting. I love animations. They're essential in an app in order to create a smooth and delightful user experience. One of my favorite things about Jetpack Compose is that it provides powerful and extensible APIs to make it easy to implement various animations in your app's UI. Many Compose animation APIs are available as composable functions, just like layouts or other UI elements, and they are backed by lower-level APIs built with Kotlin coroutines to spend functions. To understand more about the beauty and power behind an animation, I spoke with my friend, Doris Liu, the engineer on the Compose team, who builds all of the animations you can find there. Prior to Jetpack Compose, we noticed that uh, developers were fairly intimidated by um, building animations. They would first build everything in their app except the animations, and then later on they would go back and add animations when they have time or feel comfortable. It's such a pity because we think animations are so essential to the end user experience. So part of the motivation for Compose Animation is to provide a, a set of animation APIs that are simple enough so that developers feel comfortable building animations in the V1 of their app. Let's talk about what an animation is. They're an essential part of the mobile app experience. You touch your phone and it reacts. Animations use motion design to inform the user by highlighting relationships between elements, action availability, and action outcomes. Motion celebrates moments in user journeys adds character to common interactions, and can express a brand's style. Doris mentioned that developers were hesitant to put in the work to build animations into the V1 of their apps. So I asked her if perhaps that's because animation design wasn't always easy or clear. When Android first came out about 15 years ago, the concept of mobile phone was relatively new to all of us. Our primary design reference for UI is desktop and web. But as we get more and more comfortable with the mobile devices and the touch interactions, users started to demand more subtle interactions as a way to get a delightful experience as they navigate through the apps. Around the time of Ice Cream Sandwich, the Android team has really focused on making the platform built purposely for mobile, including a new animation system built earlier that year. And then in Jelly Bean, with the Project Butter, we focused on reducing the latency and providing a guarantee for frame rate so that any touch interaction would feel super responsive. Both of these technology advancements uh, were critical in delivering animation capabilities to delight our users. Doris and I then went back to talking about animations before Compose, for example. 
When animating views, in the past, you had to first update the final position of the animation and then call start on the animation. But as Nick Butcher pointed out in a talk from 2019, developers wanted to use the Animate to Final Position API that does a combination of both for you. But for me, the real power comes when you, instead of using Start, you use this Animate to Final Position API. And what this does is if the animation isn't started, it will just kick it off. But crucially, if an animation is running, um, then it will retarget it, and this will do that magic of maintaining the velocity for us and updating the target value. Yeah, that talk was super impactful for me uh, because it demonstrated how pleasant and convenient it can be to have APIs that anticipate the common use cases and then combine the multi-step boilerplate code into one simple animation call. It made me start thinking about API design from a use case-oriented perspective. A beautiful work of art is a series of layers of paint. Similarly, an animation is a series of motions that come together in a beautiful, expressive way. And the paintbrush that we use to build an animation? Jetpack Compose. OK, Doris, tell me about the first composable you wrote. Ah, without doubt, that is uh, uh, animated visibility. It is uh, probably the most commonly used composables for animating appearance and disappearance of UI elements. Actually, at around that same time, I was also working on this other concept called Animate Content Size. Um, it was this one-liner feature that allows the UI to dynamically resize itself when the content changes. We released Animate Content Size first before Animated Visibility to get feedback on this, this new concept of reactive resizing animation. It was received overwhelmingly well. Uh, developers really loved it. So this feedback from developers really helped shape the overall philosophy of animations in Compose. Yeah, definitely. Uh, for me, collaborating with the, the community is really uh, the essential part of my job. And um, I mainly use Slack channel and uh, Twitter as my source of feedback um, to see how experimental, experimental features are received or whether uh, there's any other features that developers are asking. Just seeing what people build um, on an ongoing basis kind of give us a, a sense of what is a common use case. As I mentioned earlier, we want to make the common use case uh, incredibly easy, but that does involve understanding what is a common use case. And then also when we noticed that when people struggle with a, a particular animation feature, we would then go back to the drawing board and investigate what was making the feature difficult to adopt and refine the design to, to uh, improve upon the, those features. So hearing, hearing from the developers around the world is definitely super useful in terms of evolving the uh, animation system. Thank you so much for the time, Doris. New animations in Compose fill me with emotion. So we better get moving, adding them to our apps. Twitter is one of the most widely used social media networks where you can see what's happening at any given moment. My name is Joali Sotomayor Vaquero, and I'm a software engineer on the Android client UI team at Twitter, where we work on writing reusable components and frameworks, and also supporting other engineers so they can write cool features for Twitter users. It's really nice to be able to combine Compose and Views very easily, and it has allowed us to put Compose in the hands of our feature developers much faster so they can start reaping the benefits of Compose, even in areas that are indebted to legacy systems or where we're still working on the full Compose solution. Hi, I'm Sneha. I'm an Android developer at Twitter. I'm also the technical lead on communities. A few medium-sized teams have adopted Compose, and uh, given the initial success, teams that are working on complex legacy components are also looking into using Compose for the UI. The community's team recently adopted Compose to build the feature from ground up. We took our team less than half the time that it took iOS and web to build communities on Twitter using Compose. Compose has made it so much easier to write our own UI components that are more intuitive and flexible and that have a more explicit API contract. It gives us an opportunity to rethink our design system so we can write components that fit our best practices, and it's backed by Google. Compose enables us to write unit tests, and this enables stability from the developer point of view. And we have been able to vouch for this because we've seen a lot less bugs surface on communities. Compose lets us write more explicit APIs, and 
it's been a great tool for writing our design system at Twitter. So we can have reusable UI components that all of our teams use that make their iteration and their prototyping much faster. The very first time I saw the demo at Google I.O., I was excited about it. I couldn't believe how 100 lines of traditionally setting up dynamic lists with RecycleView was going to be replaced with three lines of composable code. Developing with Compose on Android is a game changer for us. I love the simplicity of Compose and how it's so easy and intuitive to pick up. I'm looking forward to continue to see Compose growing and evolving, getting new features, and to see more libraries adopt Compose. I'm really excited to see a widespread adoption of Compose in our developer community. I'm just excited to keep writing in Compose and never have to touch an XML again. <laughs>
So we built the taskbar to make it easy to switch between your most used apps or to drag an app into split screen to view two apps side by side. So say if you're writing an email and also doing research in a browser window, or if you're comparison shopping with two Chrome windows. And what do you think the future of large screens will look like? So as the technology continues to evolve, I see these various device categories converging. So tablets becoming more like laptops when you attach a keyboard, or phones turning into a tablet with foldables. Back to Rich. Given his long-term perspective with Android, I wanted to understand what the future looks like in the tablet space. So what's going to happen post-COVID? Is that growth going to still continue? And, and if you ask me, uh, you know, my thesis is absolutely yes. Uh, if you take a look at, at 2020, you'll see that tablet usage or tablet purchases actually started to approach the, the number of laptops that were shipped. So you have tablet shipments and laptop shipments getting very close. I actually think that there's going to be a crossover point at some point in the not too distant future where there are more tablets sold annually than there are laptops. And I think once you cross over that point, you're not going to be coming back. And so what should devs do to prepare? Uh, I think there's two things. One, you know, for developers, we ask that you take a look at your app, take a look at the services that we're providing, Jetpack libraries to support larger screen, uh, and just see how your app might be reconfigured to take advantage of the additional screen real estate on a larger screen. But the other thing, and something I'm kind of more excited about, is if tablets really are going to become this new device for people to be creative and productive, Right? What new apps would take advantage of people who may be doing things stylus enabled, you know, out of the gate? What does that mean for the mobility that you have with a tablet that you don't even quite have with a laptop? Back in the early days of Android and mobile, we talked a lot about first people brought their apps to the mobile phones, and then they realized that wasn't quite right. You needed to develop for mobile first. I actually think there's going to be another wave of apps here that are thinking tablet first, right? What can I do? with that larger screen that maybe I couldn't easily do with something that was physically connected to a keyboard. And I'm excited to see what, what great ideas come from, from developers as they start to think that. Thanks so much, Rich, for helping us understand this growth and for what it means for developers when it comes to tablets. The Android eBay app is a global marketplace platform that connects millions of sellers with millions of buyers. My name is Matthew Mossman. I'm an Android engineer on the eBay mobile architecture team. I currently lead our Common Components UI library. My role on the Android architecture team at eBay and as the Common Components lead is to make our UI and UX frameworks flexible enough to better support large form factor screens in the future. We are often surprised at how many tablet users we have according to our tracking and, and analytics, so it's a very smart area to invest our time and energy into. We have many information-dense screens. For example, our sellers enjoy being able to see much more of their listing on a large form factor screen so they can preview their entire creation at once. We optimize tablet experiences by using patterns like list detail flow to represent information-dense screens in a more concise way when we have the extra screen real estate. The result is a much happier customer when they browse eBay on a tablet. Our UI components are dynamic enough to be rendered across multiple screen sizes thanks to our concerted engineering effort. One strategy that we've leaned on pretty heavily is resource qualifiers in Android that allows us to make our UI components flexible enough to be served on phones, tablets, foldables, and Chromebooks alike. One of the tools that we use is Constraint Layout, and we've just recently enabled Jetpack Compose in order to increase our velocity with regard to shipping UI features. Another tool that we have used is App Bundles, which helps us deliver tailored experiences for specific devices. Since enabling app bundles, we've seen an approximately 20% increase in user engagement across our support channels. One of our most requested features was supporting Android Dark Theme, and after implementing it, we saw positive waves across all of our social channels. We invested heavily at the design and engineering level to support tablet experiences for our users, and we're very proud to say the result is a 4.7 star rating on Google Play. One stat that jumped out at us is the fact that our tablet users engage with our app on a per session basis approximately twice as much as phone users. We find that our tablet users engage with eBay approximately 33 minutes a day on tablet, browsing, buying, and selling. 
I myself am particularly proud of the work that we've invested at the foundational level, which will better position ourselves to support large form factor screens in the future. Hello everyone. It's great to see stories of developers like Matthew and the eBay team building compelling experiences for tablets and seeing the results pay off. Before we move into our live Q&A, <clears throat> I wanted to say personally that the Russian invasion of Ukraine is weighing heavily on me. It's both a tragedy and a humanitarian crisis. At Google, our teams are working around the clock to support people in Ukraine. As developers, we carry a lot with us in our work. So I wanted to reach out in case it's weighing on you as well. It's important for me that our community is a place that helps lift us all up. I've been reaching out to my colleagues to check in, which in turn has been helpful for me as we navigate these times. And I thank you if you've been doing the same. And with that, I want to transition to our next segment. Over the past few days, uh, you've been asking us your, uh, with using hashtag Ask Android, your large screen questions. So we've assembled a crew of people here to help answer them. So here with me, I have. Hi, I'm Daniel Jacobson. I'm a product manager, and I specifically focus on making it easier for developers to build large screen optimized UI and layouts. Hello, I'm Matvey. I'm an engineer on Jetpack Compose, and I'm working on Compose related to large screen APIs. Hi, I'm Javier. I'm a designer in the material design team uh, working on foldable and large screen implementation. Hi, I'm Pietro. I'm a developer advocate working on supporting developer for uh, building application for large screen. So folks watching, please start adding your questions uh, for live screens there in the YouTube chat. Until we do that, I will start with all the questions we got uh, previously. So um, given that uh, the 12L, uh, the Android 12L went to AOSP earlier this week, I'm curious which of the new features are most exciting for users on large screen devices? Sure. Uh, personally, my favorite new feature is definitely the taskbar, especially for uh, split screen multi-window scenarios. I like to have multiple apps open at the same time. Uh, for example, say I'm writing a document and I have some research up, uh, the taskbar just makes it a lot easier for me to get my app layout set up correctly. To kind of elaborate on this a little bit, um, one of my favorite features is drag and drop. It wasn't really set up exactly with the 12L. We had this before, but with the split screen and you know being so easy to place a few apps on your own, on your one screen, uh, being able to drag and drop text and images is a uh, is a productivity booster for me at least. As a user, for me, the um, um, the notification tray is actually quite a highlight. It's such a well-designed screen that I really enjoy. And for me, is the settings, uh, the idea to, the fact that is now available with a least detailed view on a large screen, it's, uh, it's really handy, especially when you enter a lot of time in the developer options. OK, so then do we already have devices running uh, 12L? What is the first tablet or Chrome OS device launching with 12L? So we have uh, a few partners that already announced that they're going to support 12L. Uh, in the blog post, I think we have Samsung, Lenovo, and, uh, and Microsoft. Uh, for uh, starting to play right now on a large screen with 12L, uh, Lenovo made available a, a couple of beta for a 12L to run on, the, um, on their tablet, on the latest one, the 12 Pro. And that's a good option also to start to test application on large screen with the new features available. Cool, thank you. So tablet first, uh, why though? Uh, mobile first covers the tablets as well. Yeah, this is a great question. Uh, maybe I can start with this, and then I'd love Javier's opinion as well from the design point of view. Um, but I, th I think this is very much a question of like, what kind of application are you building? And depending on the app you're building and the user behavior you want to influence may, might influence how you approach your design. And so for example, let's take like docs. Like if I'm writing a document, um, the mobile or the phone experience is, is going to be somewhat limited just by virtue of what I can see on the screen. 
And the way I might think about that type of app or that type of design is the tablet or the large screen specific layout and experience is for productivity and creation. And the mobile or the, the phone app experience might be more of a companion experience for me to review or consume content or, or kind of look at content. And for that type of app, I would probably actually want to think about the tablet behavior and the tablet experience first to really create an awesome creation experience. And then I could certainly take those layout components or those visual elements and easily translate them into a great review or content consumption experience. And then I've got kind of everything across the spectrum of what I would want from that kind of app. Whereas if it's more of like a media or consumption app, yeah, maybe starting with mobile first makes sense. It, it really is kind of an app by app thing, um, but maybe Javier, if you want to expand on that. Yeah, for sure. I think one, one of the things that stands out to me is that when uh, when uh, teams are designing applications for, for phones, they actually understand the limitations quite well. And if we limit ourselves to the limitations of the phone, then uh, thinking about expanding that to a tablet sometimes it could be tricky, right? Like uh, anybody that has uh, spent some time on, uh, on responsive design that quite understands how, you know, how um, uh, the the pains of growing uh, growing into a larger device. So I, I ask you actually instead to take a step back and think about the user, right? Like what is really um, the the step that they're trying to get uh, to get at? And um, in, if you actually you know do that, then maybe um, maybe you can actually understand why sometimes it may make more sense for us for you to start on a tablet. Sometimes it may make more sense for you to start on a phone. Um, however, you know, like we definitely want to build on the momentum that um, all the great apps that are already available on phones have. But instead, actually rethink, uh, use the opportunity to expand into a tablet to expand the, the experience, not only expand the, the use um, the, the use of space, but really expand the experience of the user. One thing that I'd like to add to is like, we're already seeing some, some partners and some case studies we published where we're seeing uh, massively increased engagement and kind of usage of large screen experience compared to their phone counterparts. And going back to like the docs example, like I'm probably gonna spend more time writing a document and kind of creating and being productive than I am reviewing and reading. And so there's really a business opportunity for, for larger screen uh, experiences as well. And, and, and that's definitely something you should uh, you should consider when approaching designs. Yeah. So supporting large screen devices seems interesting, but it also seems like a lot of work. Um, is Google making any improvements on the tools and libraries to help? So, so maybe I'll start with that one and then I'm gonna to point to, to Pietro and Matt Bay as well. Um, we're doing a lot of work. And one of the things that we recognize is that depending on where you're at in your application development, like you may have 10 years worth of existing code that's that you can't rewrite from scratch and can't migrate overnight. And, and we recognize that. And so one of the things that's actually coming with 12L is uh, new activity embedding features that makes it easier for developers with multi-activity uh, application architectures to just create large screen and multi-panel uh, optimized layouts with their existing code with with very little new code it's mostly configuration driven so it's actually a fairly kind of cheap solution to get to a better state it may not be the best but at least you're going to be better similarly with compose we have a, a kind of a mature interop model so you can take existing views code and embed compose layouts or vice versa and that lets you kind of incrementally update and modernize your your code over time um and then i'm going to hand it off to pietro to maybe talk about some of the jetpack library work with window manager and more there's quite a bit of stuff coming in yeah, well, activity embedding is part of a, a Jetpack window manager, so it's a, it's already a good start. Uh, window can manager. I say, uh, can I say what activity embedding is a little bit more? Yeah, it, it's practically if you have an application that is uh, built with multiple activities. Going back, for example, to the settings that I was talking before. Uh, usually, the settings uh, you have uh, one only one view or the list of the detail because these are be were built originally as two different activities to show both on the screen, we are using uh, uh, activity embedding in this case. We are showing two activities at the same time on the screen. And, our, and, and the API allows to control uh, the, the back stack and uh, how you want to navigate from one activity to the other, uh, animations. Uh, and uh, 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 there are a lot of features that uh, are available. But if you just need to put the two activity on the screen, it's really just as Daniel was saying a configuration that you added to your application, so an XML file, um, and this is an easy choice uh, if your application is built with activity. As probably we are pushing towards having a, a single activities with uh, fragments uh, on the view system or with compose, and in that case uh, um, you don't need to use uh, activity embedding, but it's a it's a good solution for existing application. Uh, 
And the other thing is that uh, with Jetpack Window Manager, we have support for foldables with the display features, uh, and we have uh, support for getting the information about the screen size. Uh, we had uh, deprecated a, a series of APIs uh, in, in Android uh, S uh, and Android uh, R before that, so 11 and 12. Um, and the right way to get the correct information about your screen size and the window size of your application is using uh, the window matrix API. That is a, a API 30 uh, API and can be used uh, also through a Jetpack Window Manager back uh, in a backward compatible way back to API 14. So it's um, that's probably the best option uh, to to know what uh, what is the size of your window. And that drives some information regarding, for example, if you're using camera or uh, if you're using media projection, it's a very important information to get right uh, to avoid to stretch the image uh, on um, on the screen or through the media projection on the on the remote connection. Yeah, to to add kind of from the compost perspective, uh, because I'm I'm coming from compost perspective usually. Um, even like with the views interrupt, uh, if you use compose, I think it's kind of a little bit less work than you usually anticipate to, uh, uh, you know, even than you usually expect when you uh, do some large screen adaptation. Why? Because in compose it's easy to reuse pieces and you know place them in a, in a different orientations one by one, one 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 on top of each other. So hopefully, like compose overall will uh, make it kind of less complex to adopt to the large screens, uh, large screen layouts. Also on the kind of guidance side, we also recognize that, you know, sometimes you really want to have some guidance. How do you do a structure, not only the UI, but also like the business logic, the navigation. So that's why we have um, samples published already. And uh, we have like reference implementations in some sample apps and also uh, documentation on the developer Android com site where you can find a uh, good starting points to make it uh, less complex to Bootstrap. I mean, I can uh, stop you here so I can ask the next question because it's going to be for you as well, Manpai. Um, how can we use Jetpack Compose to build separate layouts for large uh, large devices? I mean, with XML, we would have separate files. What would we do in Compose? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. I think in Compose, uh, again, I'm kind of biased, but uh, it's going to be it's going to be even easier. So basically, the idea is um, Sometimes uh, XML layouts they kind of ask you to do a lot of copy pasting, I would say, or like they you know they have a mm, tendency to sometimes then diverge. And then you have uh, problems when syncing them and using them properly. With Compose, you can build a few like ready to use parts of your screen that you can mix and match, and then dynamically um, place them in a row or in a column, vertically, horizontally. Um, add some dynamic features again like when you maybe you know when you scale your application you scale your window you want to add some animations i think it's way easier right now with compose um so yeah i think just actually the the question the answer to this question is that just by using jetpack compose and its nature of uh, dynamicity will already give you uh, ability to support large screens and large devices yeah, and also check out Jet News. Uh, sorry, check out Jet News in the Compose samples to see uh, how we implemented this. So I think Jet News shows a live screen uh, implementation, and then Jetcaster uh, for tabletop uh, for foldable support. And just to like really quickly emphasize one point Matt made because I know we have a lot of questions. Um, but like with resource qualified layouts, you typically have the duplicate code problem that Matt called out, and we've also heard from a lot of developers that this creates an ongoing maintenance burden. That, that just creates more complexity over time. So it's an expensive kind of upfront solution to duplicate the code that then has ongoing cost. Whereas the reusability of Compose components means you're only writing that code one time and you're using it in different places. So anytime you need to make updates or bug fixes, you're only doing it once and it, and it scales to your entire app. So it just makes things easy. Um, are there any UI patterns or best practices I can follow to build large screen optimized UI? 
So I think the, the first thing that comes to mind here is the canonical layouts. Uh, Javier, do you want to start talking about what, what these canonical layouts are? <laughs> Absolutely. I think that, you know, uh, another way to think about them is um, think about them as like um, uh, sort of an open, uh, uh, an open floor plan in your in your apartment, right? Like you want to know where you want to put your kitchen, you want to know where your living room goes, where you, you're hopefully going to sleep. Um, so it's kind of similar in this um, in 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 relationship to this, right? Like we want to we want to be thinking about these uh, canonical layouts as uh, sort of um, uh, ways in which we can organize information inside. Where where do we put navigation components? Where do you uh, do you set up your content? How does your content behave whenever it's growing or when the when the screen is actually getting larger or smaller? Um, so um, we've actually created three uh, layout canonical layouts that are uh, optimized for large screens. Um, and those are actually uh, super helpful in, in helping you think through your on your journey from starting on a phone and uh, in growing into your um, into your larger screens. And the other part to think to think about is um, you know again taking a step back and, and thinking about your your large screen application. You definitely want to consider what is the you know what are the the uh, critical user journeys that you want to target, right? Mm -hmm. um, Typically, like in a phone, we uh, we've uh, grown accustomed to thinking about them quite a bit in our um, in in our everyday lives as you know designers, developers. But um, uh, whenever we look at a tablet, we pro we probably want to revisit them, right? Like um, the user case, the use cases of um, uh, of the user expectation on a tablet is slightly different from that of a phone. So we want to revisit um, you know the things that we want to support and figure out what are the best ways of supporting them. Um, so through the material guidance that we have available today. Uh, you should be able to um, to start tackling some of these bigger issues. Uh, our components are ready for uh, for um, for use in all, in, um, in these larger devices, and hopefully that should be a, a useful resource for you to utilize. And then, from a developer perspective, do we have any best practices of how to implement the canonical layouts? Have you talked about? Definitely, definitely. I think maybe maybe Daniel as well can elaborate on this a little bit later, but um, I'll just start off. Um, so we have uh, we have some guidance. So uh, as, as Florian already mentioned, we have least detail canonical layouts in, in general. You know, how do you structure one thing that you click and get to another screen on a phone? So two panes that uh, can exist together on one screen. It's uh, apparently not a very easy task to do. Therefore, we have like guidance. Uh, we have a guidance that is published on the developer sites developer um, android.com and then as a reference implementation jet news uh, hosted on github so go check it out it's definitely it should help you get started with that and in general um the canonical layouts we have we have a, we have a few other um you know recommendations and uh, around how you want to do it uh, both in views and compose so we have this in mdc and compose um so hopefully you'll be able to achieve any of the canonical layouts which is very nice as well like if you for example a single developer who uh, don't have, if you don't have your own uh, UX person, just you know go pick this up, try and see um, how it works for your large screen. Uh, oh yeah, actually, and how to get started. for the view system, uh, some of these components are uh, already available in the in the Jetpack uh, library. So we have this sliding pane layout. It's a series of uh, uh, libraries that are built on that are using Jetpack Window Manager. So sliding pane layout. Uh, the uh, navigation component uh, is built on top of that, and it's integrated with the sliding pane layout. That is this de uh, least detailed view that automatically, if you're, you have enough space on the screen, uh, is going to show both uh, panels. Uh, otherwise, it's only show uh, the, the current one. And, uh, and the preference, uh, uh, so Jetpack preference that is built on top of, uh, of this. Um, and these are already available. Then we have Navrail uh, components uh, and so on. So we have, as much as I was uh, saying, we have both solution for uh, Compose at this moment uh, and also solution for the view system. Daniel? They, uh, they pretty much said everything I'd like to. The only thing I'd add is this is an area that we are actively working on making even easier over time. We recognize this is like a big, big component to, to large screen optimized layouts. And so if you have feedback, if you have thoughts, we would love to hear that. Um, but yeah. And then I guess the last thing I'd add is uh, the tracker sample is a good sample that demonstrates a list detail views based layout using sliding pane layout. Yeah. Cool. For fluid window resizing, so for example, for Chrome OS, do you recommend overriding configuration changes and handling all UI changes in Compose? Um, hmm. Let's let's see. Um, overall, I I would say. Uh, for now, like the best practice we recommend is just to um, handle everything in Compose in this regard. I think it's gonna a nice 
a way to provide a dynamacy that is needed for you, right? You, you want to have th uh, things to be dynamic, therefore it, it's way easier to handle them in a code. Um, given that com in Compose, we just kind of recompose. Uh, you can make this to just recompose on a, a configuration change. I think that would be kind of my personal recommendation as well. Um, yeah. It will allow you to change the number of grid cells, like vertical or horizontal ones when you resize the window, but completely change your layout from one pane to two panes and do a lot of different stuff. So yeah, I think we have some guidance again in a sample kind of showcases that you in activity puts in the manifest all the right flags and then Compose uh, does the work. And the thing I'd add, I think the word that sticks out to me in this question is fluid and thinking about kind of animations and transitions. And I think one advantage of, of kind of adopting this model with Compose with overriding configuration changes is that you'll have more control over element transitions and kind of layout transitions. Whereas if you just kind of adopted standard configuration changes, you might have like an activity recreation event where basically you'd see like a flash of the UI to go from one layout state to the other. Um, so yes, I, I think you kind of have the right right model in your head. Um, this is an area that, that I think we can we can do better at providing some samples. And so we'll look into like creating a sample that demonstrates going from a, a one pane layout to a two pane layout fluidly with, with nice smooth animation animations and transitions and things like that. One thing we haven't really talked a lot uh, so far is tooling. So we got a question about Android Studio. Will uh, Android Studio be available for ARM slash tablets in a way we could someday build and see the tool in the same machine it runs? Uh, so there's kind of a way to do this on Chrome OS today, but you kind of have to hack around it. Um, but I know Pietro is going to say something. I'll, I'll let him kind of add to that. <laughs> no, what was about that? Uh, so it's, uh, <laughs> Chrome OS, it's, it's a, a solution at this moment. Uh, you need to have the right machine, and there is some, uh, some, it's not super easy to set it up, but uh, that could be an option. Um, but the emulator is also a, a very good option. So it's uh, it's way faster than uh, it was in the past. So if you have not used the emulator lately, I, I suggest to give it a look because it's uh, it's much much better. And uh, and we have uh, especially a new feature for uh, supporting large screen uh, that. Um, that that, that I think make it even more useful than working just on a tablet. And looks like we only have time for one last question. I want to optimize my existing application for live screen devices. Where should I start? Yeah, so I think there's a bunch of resources linked in the live stream, but uh, where I would go is to uh, d.android.com or developer.android.com slash large dash screens. And that will take you to an abundance of resources and links, including case studies, including uh, links to the design best practices, to development best practices, et cetera. So if there's one place to start, I would recommend that. Um, and then we also are, are uh, updating our large screen quality guidelines very soon. And that's like a kind of a great resource for you to check uh, if you're meeting kind of our large screen requirements and, and our standards for what is a good experience on larger screen devices. That's kind of a good place to double check and kind of end your journey as, as you're implementing and, and kind of keep referring back to that resource. Um, one thing we'll be adding to that really soon is, is also uh, test instructions for each of the different large screen requirements. So you'll understand like, okay, like I need to test my app in this specific way. Does it meet this requirement? Yes or no. And, and that's kind of your checklist of, did you do it or did you not? So those would be my, my two top resources. And then and I would like, add, yeah. sorry, I would add uh, <laughs> the code labs. I know we have a window manager code lab, and then we also have a couple of samples for, for Compose and for views. Javier? Yeah, from the design side, I was just going to um, just talk about material. Material design should actually be uh, uh, be a good uh, resource as well. We do have um, guidance updated on that uh, on the site. Um, so you should be able to navigate to the material.io um, and find resources there. From the engineering side, I would like to just mention, you know, to kind of get started very, very easily is to just run your app on large screen and, you know, see, see how it looks, see what's missing, and just starting by doing that. It's basically as simple as that. Yeah, from my point of view, the app guide and, and the testing guidance that is going to be uh, available shortly, it's, it's the right starting point to understand uh, how your application is behaving on a large screen. Um, on 12 l for example, there is the compatibility mode uh, that uh, may surprise that uh, and it may surprise you and uh, and it's something that uh, you should probably test uh, as soon as possible and, uh, and 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 update the application if necessary or uh, but again, 
the testing guide is going to be a, a, the best starting point. Oh, thank you everyone. This is all the time we had. So thank you folks watching and asking questions and our guests for answering them. To learn more about Lark Screens, Android Studio and Compose, register to our first Android App Excellence Summit. We'll make sure we link it in the description below. So go and enjoy the Android show. See you soon. Maro, I am so excited to finally get to talk to you. Um, and I know that leading Android developer relations is a new role for you. We're really happy to have you. And I, I really would love to ask you why you took this new role and what makes you super excited about Android. Thanks for the question. I love Android and this is definitely my dream job. And I, I think about the reach and impact that we have with Android. There's billions of users around the world using these devices. And um, to me, I can't think of anything else that I can do that has this level of impact and reach. Uh, and also, I love developers. I'm a developer myself. And I think about the how developers are building apps and experiences that users are using on a daily basis. So um, to me, this is the most fun job. And I think it's really exciting to make sure to, to know that the work that we're doing is having impact on not only on users, but also on people that I know, friends and family. So the Android community has a really long, proud history of developing open source software and libraries, of experimenting and refining new architectures, design patterns, UI patterns, and you know what we think are best practices. And your team is sort of a go-between between us and the people who actually make Android. Can you tell us how you see that like relationship? Well, first of all, we, we are developers ourselves and we have a lot of empathy and we want to make sure that we're providing a great developer experience on Android. Um, I see ourselves as a bridge between the external developer communities and our internal product and engineering teams. Um, where we have the most impact is when we're able to do a good translation between the needs of the community or the developer community and how we're building our products. And if you look across modern Android development, you'll notice that a lot of the best ideas that we've had um, have come really from the needs from the community. Uh, I still remember when we did the announcement of Kotlin at Google I.O. a few years ago and how excited the developer community was about it. And, and the truth is that we, we did this as a result of a need and ask that was coming from the community. Um, so yeah, and we have more examples like that. So we're really happy to work together with developers to make Android better for you all. And in Android 13, what are the features and updates in it that you want devs to pay the most attention to or that you could you think that we could benefit the most from? So it's still early in the, the release cycle. And you know we have monthly updates, so you'll see our uh, developer previews first, and then you'll see our betas, and then we'll have the final release later in the year. Um, I'm excited about the bigger themes that we have in this release. We have um, three themes. First, privacy and security. Second, developer productivity. And then we have a big, big focus on tablets, as you know, that we've been talking about this for a while. Um, when it comes to privacy and security, one of the features that I'm most excited about is the photo picker. It makes it easier for, for you as a developer to give access to an app so they can access the, the pictures and videos from a user, but without having to the user have access to all of the media files for the developer. And then you have to ask for less permission. So it makes the whole thing much easier. Uh, in terms of developer productivity, we've done so much, so much work on as you know, on modern Android development over the last few years. So we can lower the cost of building on Android and make it more valuable for you. Uh, and we continue with that as our themes. Uh, one of the features that I like in this release is the per app language preferences. Uh, with this API, you're able to um, offer for users that they can choose different languages on your app. Uh, for users like me, I speak both Spanish and English. This is very useful. And so it makes it easier for developers to provide this feature for, for users. And then in tablets or, or for tablets and large screens, 
as you know, we're very excited about the growth we're seeing uh, in this space. And um, you will continue to do more work uh, in this release that it's coming after all the work we've done with on 12L. And we're doing this to make it easier for you to optimize your apps and make it better um, so you can support this new larger form factors. Mara, so looking through the rest of the year, what are some important areas that we as devs should look into and focus on? With, with every release, uh, I think the most important thing that you can do as a developer is making sure that you're testing uh, for compatibility against the release. Uh, in Android 13, we made most of the app-facing changes as an opt-in, so you, they, you won't get the changes unless you target the latest release. Uh, but because of that, it's even more important that you do compatibility testing. And so one of my favorite features in the release is the Compat Framework, and this allows you to toggle on and off these app-facing features so you are able to test whether they work or don't work. You don't want a user getting a new update or a new device and your app being broken. So this is, to me, this is the first priority. Um, then second, we, we just talked about ta tablets and large screens before, and you saw Rich um, also talk about all of the you know, huge growth that we're seeing in the space. Uh, there are over 250 million devices uh, Android devices currently running uh, that are either tablets, foldables, or Chrome OS devices. And so we really obviously want developers to, um, you know, invest in this space. And I'm very excited to see the types of experiences that you'll build, not only optimizing your apps so they work well, but also new types of experiences that you can build in this new uh, type of form factors. And, and then I talked about also developer productivity. And one of the areas that I'm most excited about is Compose. Compose is something that we've been building together for a few years now with the community. Uh, it's a big jump in the way that we are doing UI on Android. Uh, I know that myself, I was learning, I've been trying to learn Compose over the last couple of months, and it's just, it feels so much more intuitive, so much easier to use. So I'm hoping that all of you now are, you know, already using it, and, and I'm excited to see the types of um, things that the, that, that the community is doing with Compose and how we can continue to build it together. I can't believe she didn't answer my question. Well, you asked when Log Cat will be renamed to Log Dog. And your silence is deafening. That's all the show we have. Want more? On the Compose front, go do the Compose Pathway. For tablets, make sure your app works well on all devices and check out our documentation at this link for more info. And stay tuned for our next Math Skills series. This time, Architecture, kicking off later this month. In the meantime, go watch the data store videos if you missed it. They'll help you be more productive and have more fun while programming. Thanks for watching The Android Show. Let us know what you want to hear more about on Twitter, and we'll see you next time.